Welcome to Claris Talk AI. I am Matt Navarre. And I'm Chris Sipolite. Hey, Matt. Good to see you. Today, we have some good stuff on our agenda. So the Apple WWWWDC was Oof. last week, I guess. Um, I was at the .fmp yeah. conference just before that in Berlin. We were going to talk about Claristotle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exciting. I know. About Claristotle. Yeah, that's the learning initiative. And then and you've got something coming I do. out, don't you? I have something. Well, it's something in, in development. I would say pretty early development. And we'll talk about that. And then you have something to talk about as well, which will be yep. involved in some screen sharing. So people, that's what's coming up. Yes, sir. Or so... person. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I Mom. think it might be person. <laughs> <laughs> Moms. Yeah. <laughs> At least we have two two people listening. Yeah, but uh, my, yeah, this will be a good one to check away, out. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's watching wow. from heaven. Oh man. Yeah. Well, hope, I hope there's uh, good reception. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Starlink actually reaches out there, oh. actually. So yeah. yeah. Let's That's just let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> Please. So, so WWC, um, what's your take? Well, so I'll I'll admit, well, we, you know, we you and I talked a ton about it. Um sure. you know, absolutely, yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, I'd been paying a lot of attention to what I thought was gonna happen. And I Found myself about 50 minutes into the now that they're, 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 just to be clear that the presentation that I'm alluding to right now is was the 10 a.m. Pacific one that, you know, was there pre-recorded. Just looks like every other, you know, product yeah. launch ever. And I, I remind I had to remind myself and I think we should all remind ourselves that Apple is essentially a B to C company. They're a consumer. They cater to consumers. Like when we watch yeah. uh, Google, Google's announcements or Microsoft's announcements or open AI, like, yeah. They're catering to businesses and they're trying to find business use cases, right? I had to remind myself 50 minutes in that, like, you know, then we're talking about Jamojis and um, yeah, just silly things. Um, yeah, that, that that actually is their market. And so, I, if I was being totally honest with you, I was taking notes and I was saying to myself, like, hmm. Did they miss again? Right, that was my initial thought. What was yours originally? Because I, 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 I'll, that's just a tease. I, I'm not gonna. Well, I guess I kind of knew about that part. But what really surprised me is that they have the fastest iPad they've ever made shipping now. <laughs> that's, oh. always, that's always the part of those things. The fastest. I frankly yeah. missed it completely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it's just always, you know. Of course, the new version is always faster than the old one. But anyway. Well, and I yeah. think the I mean, thinnest. The thinnest anyway it doesn't matter so yeah the first part was like hardware software uh, you know stuff uh and then the second part second part yeah well so then after the then after the stock essentially dropped almost three <laughs> percent overnight and everyone was completely underwhelmed by what they had seen my notes for our discussion essentially said and i'll admit i put something on our slack channel uh that we used to coordinate this that essentially said there's nothing to talk about. Let's find some find something else. I quickly edited that the next day because the 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 presentation that people should in fact uh, check out was the State of the Union, and that's when they talked about how all this is actually working. So we're we're referring to the uh, Apple intelligence, and um, there's mm -hmm. a lot to unpack here. But I think if we focus first on probably the most profound part of it was well, first of all, I'll, let me just spoil it. The big thing that I think made the stock drop, and then of course it skyrocketed the next day. So congrats for everybody that bought the dip. But the thing that underwhelmed everybody was that they said, oh, they, Apple doesn't have their own models, right? Like this was their big chance to say, well, yeah, we've got one too. Um, they do. They actually have two, uh, two of their own proprietary foundation models. Uh, and we'll go into that here in just a moment, but I, that's a bit of a spoiler. Like people yeah. just thought, oh, well, they did a, you know, a deal with, um, open AI and they have a deal with open AI, right? And they so, absolutely and I, and I, do. I really like the how that the description of that, which we'll talk about. But I think I don't know. So we made predictions. I think we did pretty good. Yes. <laughs> oh, no doubt. I mean, like they hit uh, privacy. The they hit that privacy nail extremely hard. Nailed it. So yeah. yeah, if we if we let's take a look at uh uh um uh, per, the uh, personal context part of it that that was the private that's really where the privacy comes into play mm -hmm. so the way we had framed it up you know just to kind of set the stage for this is that we said what are they going to do how are they going to train a model uh, and by the way first of all this is kind of a big deal so we were saying how are they going to train a model because they have this position on data privacy yep. 
So then if you have a position on data privacy, how do you train a model? Well, here is the answer. I dug very deep into this and I finally found the answer. So here's their official statement on the data they use to train their two foundation models, which we'll mm -hmm. go into it here in a second. Training data includes licensed data and publicly available data collected by AppleBot. AppleBot? Apple has a has a web crawler. Did you know this? I no. did not know this. So um hmm. I did a little bit of research and <clears throat> sure enough, Apple they bot. do have they have a web crawler. It's on the so, Apple website. It's information. Bit, and and it's not even new. This is apparently yeah. something that they've had for a long time. So their statement on it is it's uh licensed data and publicly available data collected by AppleBot, Apple's web crawler, web publishers can in fact opt out of having their content used for Apple intelligence training. Yep. That would probably be something good to know before the training, but you know, you, you can go in there and opt out if you don't want to be part of future training, right? So so they had they basically had to train models and so they did it with their own data and then I'm sure to some mm -hmm. degree they I didn't hear any, maybe I've missed some announcements on the on the licensing agreements that they came up with, but they came up with two different models to do that. So that's kind of a big deal. Now we yeah. said, great, that's one of the privacy things. The second thing is um, what data does Apple have access to that nobody has access to? And you and I me. talked a lot about their wall. Yeah, me, the yeah. walled garden. And, yeah. and so to me, that is hugely profound. Like, I, I don't know if, there's many organizations, at least at the scale that Apple can, that can do the type of things that we're going to see with personal in intelligence. I mean, or personal context, personal. If context, you're fully sorry. in the Google ecosystem, wouldn't they have a huge amount of information on you? Like I would you have... fully, fully expect. Well, yeah. actually, here this is an interesting point. Um, Google for workplace and uh, Microsoft, whatever the work thing is, mm -hmm. we're like here at iSolutions, we're a Google workplace. Um, and oh, so so the Microsoft 365, the co-pilot concept, right? So what's actually happening in, in those two cases? Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft specifically has something called the Microsoft Graph, which is really what co-pilot is for, for work is you've got all your stuff on their platform, meaning you've got all your PowerPoint presentations and your Google Docs, or wait, yep. I'm sorry, whatever the Microsoft yeah, ones sure. are. And so it has the, the real technology is it creates this graph database, which is uh, basically a, a, a data lake of all your all your organization's data. And then what Copilot does is it allows users to interact with that. So when you're buying Copilot, you know, the revolutionary thing there isn't the Copilot part of it. It's the fact that all your data is pulled together in one place and now you can interact with it. Now, it's kind of a nothing burger if you don't have any of your information in the Microsoft platform or yeah. the Google Workspaces platform. Yeah. And Google Workspaces formally just announced their, I mean, they I think they've kind of had it for a while, but they formally just sent an email out like two days ago yeah. that says, hey, all your Google Docs and Google Sheets and your Gmail and all that stuff is now, you know, accessible. So that's not revolutionary, but what Apple did is they said, hey, Matt, all your text messages and emails and various interactions that you have on device within mm -hmm. the private wall garden that we all trust yeah. are now available to what I'm referring to as your personal graph. So that's right. what, they're, what they're talking about when they talk about personal context. And, yeah, and, and I to think me, a couple of big things, right? So there's that. <clears throat> the data never goes to Apple servers. And the AI processing actually happens on the processor on my device, not in the cloud, in, unless it, there's yeah, circumstances where some, it does. So those are that's really, really big. And I think that's also kind of what we predicted because, yeah, of, their, well, because it, of the privacy stance. Well, and also the some acquisitions that they made were all yeah. about running models on the device. Well, yeah, we and did so, get a clue. <laughs> and so there were, there were definitely some breadcrumbs. Now, um, um, so what you just mentioned is, is a really big deal. Um, so so that's how they're facilitating it. And I want to show, I'm going to share, I'll have the yeah. YouTube folks get ready in a second because I'm going to share what we're talking about and show show this, uh, uh, what they released. But to, to speak to the uh, personal context thing, this is such such an important idea when it comes to interacting with language models in general. Let me let me zoom out for a second and then we'll yeah. zoom back in. Zooming out, um, uh, like I did a a, a prompting webinar, a, a prompting basics webinar, and one of the mm -hmm. principles that I shared with everybody is uh, instead of saying you know when you're prompting and you and like I think everybody when they first start prompting or they start looking up prompting guidelines, <clears throat> they run across 
say to the model, you are a helpful assistant, right? Like, like, like somehow it's not helpful or it's not an assistant. Like it's yeah. not about when you're prompting and you're interacting with these language models, It it's a, a nothing burger to tell it what it is. You tell it what, who you are is the point. So we have this concept of call, called user personas and yeah. every one of our, I talked about this in, in the Gage conference, um, and the, some of the user personas that we write for our deployments are pages and pages long, man. Sure. Like, and then in addition to the user persona, like on our intuition platform, which I'll show a little bit later on, we can identify, these are multi-user platforms. So we identify who each user is. Each user gets their own persona, right? personal intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. they, or person, God, I keep calling it personal intelligence. It's a personal context. Mm -hmm. And why is personal context meaningful? Because you care about certain things. Like if you and I work at the same company, you care about certain things to do your job. I care about certain things to do my job. I look at information a certain way, or I have access to certain information, whatever it is. So mm -hmm. you and I could ask the same exact question to the same exact language model and get com significantly yeah, different absolutely. answers because if it yeah. knows who I am versus yeah, that, who you are. So now- that source of truth but, thing that I let you talk about, right? Like, all, yeah. all the time. So- so providing the the truth and then also telling it who I am and what I care about. That's how mm -hmm. we actually focus the aperture on on what I care about. So that's, right. I would say, if it, it's somewhat controversial, well, because no, none of these people are listening to us right now, but if for some reason you're just dismissing AI and because you, like you asked a couple of questions to ChatGPT yeah. and it got the answers wrong, I am here <laughs> to say that's just as much on you person not listening right now as it is on the models. Like yeah. you have to know how to ask the questions. And so providing I, I, context yeah. about who you are helps you get those right. Now that's what Apple did here. So it knows, I'm a little worried about maybe how much <laughs> some knows. of the things that, yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not always being yeah. professional when I'm texting my friends and, you know, emailing people and stuff like that. Oh. So I wonder how much of that it's going to bring into my context, but I think there's really yeah. interesting intelligence behind all that. So yeah, that's I don't know, your thoughts that. on your thoughts on how do you feel about letting Apple into your walled garden to make your, your AI, um, uh, experience more I, more personalized. I actually think that the amount of data that my Apple Watch knows about me is insane. Uh, it, if you trust that, like it literally knows how your heart is pumping, right? Like, like yeah. it knows more about you than you do, frankly, right? So yeah. I, I think we've already gone to the level of extending trust. I mean, I, I doubt they do it, but if I'm watching a movie on Apple TV, it can monitor my heart rate and see if, and see if I like the movie or not, right? It can presume that Oh, I yeah. love that. That's yeah. actually a brilliant idea. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, algorithms have been tracking our likes and dislikes forever. Like right. every time yeah, you yeah, go yeah. on to Netflix and say you don't like, by the way, here's a little secret. Every time I go and I don't like a movie on Netflix, I go pick another movie somewhere and don't like it as well, just to balance my algorithm out. So oh. I don't want it to think like I have like this bias or something like that. So I'm, I'm it, Apple has been, Apple knows all those decisions uh, for us as well. So, okay. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the models and the performance of them and kind of where stuff's okay, going to get so done. First. So first, if anyone's wondering what the ultimate resource is, this is going to be in the show notes. This is the paper uh, called introducing Apple's on device and server foundation models. They don't have like a fancy name for them, like, you know, Gemini or something like that. They're just Apple's on device and server foundation models. So, um, oh, you know, when you get past the hypnotic header here, um, this was all the stuff that was reviewed essentially in the, and there are some sessions, but mostly in the uh, State of the Union. So first off, let's take a look at this part. Um, we they talked hmm, a little bit training, about the training. Let's training. actually go. Yeah, we're going to look at the architecture here. So yeah. they did something really interesting when they trained these models for starters. They did this concept of uh, adapters, which is, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but it, it seems very similar to me to like this mix of experts approach. If anyone listening is familiar with that, it really just sort of like segmented out. Um, you'll And for those that are looking on screen, it segments out summarization, proofreading, mail replies, that kind of stuff. So it's really saying like, hey, um, this part of the the architecture is assigned for summarization. So you go do summarization mm -hmm. and and you do tone adjustment and all that. And then they all kind of come together, um, you know, as one. Now, so multimodal, um, you mean, kind of a thing? Yeah, um, yeah, multimodal generally indicates like its ability to process images or, or video or audio different and types text. of things, not just different different models for text processing, like we just saw. 
Yeah, like different yeah. different expertise, basically, right? Yeah. So um, let's let's look at this. So here's actually this is what the architecture really looks yeah, like. Yeah, this so, is a really um, good chart here. So down here, so to to kind of talk people through it, the silicon is such an important part of this, right? Like like they've been mm -hmm. moving in this direction, and it is meaningful to us. And by the way, I just like ordered a M3 max to to get ready for all this the the super light and thin um ipad that you mentioned in jest yeah. earlier actually M4. is intended to be able to run these types of things um and shoot you know now is as good a time as any to just mention this but for those that are interested in this stuff i did a little sleuthing and found out that in order to run all these things whenever the heck they come out not every phone or device is going to be able to run them. So uh, we're course. showing the, the list on screen, but you basically the, the all the way test back is, to the iPhone XR and 12, dang, or 11. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah iPhone, iPhone 11. 11. So basically, so like my wife has a iPhone 13 mini because she loves the mini because it fits mm. in her purses and stuff. And I was, I looked this up to see if she'd be able to run the AI stuff. So yeah, all the way back to XR. So basically anything that can run uh, iOS 17 can run these. And that was kind of interesting because I thought it was going to be exclusive to the Apple Silicon right. devices, right? So you, you'll notice that they're leveraging their silicon both on device, which is for those viewing, that's what's on the left, and and on the servers as well too. Their servers, right? Are also um, Apple which, Silicon. That uh, was Apple fascinating. Also. And I don't. I mean, we don't have access to these um, servers ourselves, but over here on the upper right hand yeah. corner, and sorry for those that are listening, I'm just pointing to the server stack. This is the thing that we just looked at a little bit, you know, that has these, uh, adapters in there. Uh, you can kind of see visually Matt that they've got adapters going in the, the language and the image side. So yeah. without getting too into the weeds, this adapter thing is kind of one of the things that's actually makes them special. So over here on device, the left-hand side, but, uh, above the Silicon is, where the on-device models actually live, which is really, really cool. And it has a semantic index, which is uh, akin to, you know, we've talked a lot about vector databases and searching and, yeah. and the, the, the vector index. It's basically on-device semantic vector database for practical purposes. And then the app intense toolbox. We're going to get to that in a second. That is actually kind of a big deal as it pertains to us Claire's folks. And then up on the top are all the apps in the experiences. Siri, the writing tools, yeah. your favorite new tool, the Jamoji uh, and Image <laughs> Playground, which I know you I, can't wait to get your hands I on. I entirely forgot about that whole Jamoji thing. You keep bringing it up, but whatever. <laughs> oh, because I'm so excited about it. The, so, the Memojis totally missed me too, whatever. Um, okay, now so, this this chart here you're looking at, the writing benchmarks yeah. on device server above, totally confused me because they're talking okay. about these models. And um, right, so Apple on device, like on your device, well, Mistral so, 7B, so Gemma 7B, V-3 Mini. Yeah. So first of all, what what do we? Why are we even looking at writing benchmarks? Well, first of all, they really announced three things that you can do on device slash push up to the server every now and then. It's writing tools, which is like Grammarly and you know ChatGPT or whatever. Yeah. Uh, image generation, which is the I won't mention it again. Jamoji and mm -hmm. Image Playground, um, and then the the third one is <clears throat> is um uh well it uh. So, uh and I completely forgot what the third one is, but we'll get to that in a second. But here's the deal. What are benchmarks? Benchmarks generally, when a new model comes out, you go to Hugging Face and they've got all these different like leaderboards, they call them. Yeah. Um, and they list, they, they, they kind of agree, like the industry agrees as a whole, like here's all the different ways that we can evaluate a model and they run it through these tests. And so every time a new model comes out, they, the, generally the model trainers will run the, um, them through the benchmarks so we can compare. Apple did not use the benchmarks that the rest of the industry standard uses. They created their own benchmarks. And instead of revealing how, you know, what the tests were, they basically said, here's how we stack up against other models. Now, um, uh, so we're looking on the left-hand side at on device on and device. on the right-hand side as the okay. server. So here's how to interpret what this means. We're looking at the idea of summarization of text, which is like when they talked about their feature of, which is a great use of, of language models, by the way, even in your applications, summarizing meetings or, um, I, yeah, I mean, 
like if you're not summarizing your meetings with AI, you're I what are you doing? Like, what are you waiting for? Like it, it just makes no sense not to do that anymore. Yeah. Composition though is where you're actually writing things, you know, like right. write me a blog uh, article or something. Right. So <clears throat> we see Apple on device model right on the top. Like they're they're saying, hey, these are the best models. Well, let me give you some context here. If we just look at summarization, Apple on device is the top of the leaderboard, but it, it is only on top of uh, these models called Mistral 7B, Gemma 7B, Phi 3 Mini, and Gemma 2B. What are those things? Yeah. Those are really small. 7B and 2B and 3B mean billion parameters. Just for some context, uh, uh, OpenAI's uh, 3.5, GPT 3.5 was mm -hmm. about 480 billion parameters. And, and these some are 7 say billion, that, 3 billion. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And so okay. these, and so this is why this is super important. Like, if you're thinking of like, I, I talked a lot about and engage about how important open source models are, for example, right? The problem with open source models is they they don't have the same capabilities of the foundation models up in the cloud. And so, and then also if you're gonna run them locally, you need a massive amount of compute. Right. Whereas you don't have to pay for token costs, but the amount of compute that you need is is ridiculous to the point where my team, we basically have a threshold at about, 10 billion parameters that you just can't run these in production at any level of cost that makes any sense. Right. Yeah. It's, so I guess, I, I guess the question I would have for you, I think I had it a while ago. Um, how much compute does a, does a basic query take on say chat GPT for um, Omega Omicron for O? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, well, we don't know because you can't run those locally, and and uh, OpenAI or slash yeah, Azure yeah. or Microsoft for sure takes that. So, so a it. good way to measure that is exactly, you know, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up in this context. It's in the billion parameters, right? So I would say that about ten times the size of the models that are running on device mm -hmm. is about the maximum that you would reasonably like want to pay for to run on like an AWS extra large. Um, yeah, I guess and, and we get into like GPU available. Well, I mean, if, like if I had, too. if I had a bunch of, let's just say I had a bunch of Mac minis or whatever. Um, and I wanted to wire them up with a, with a model for um, that was GTP 4.0. And I did a query and it came back with a response in two seconds. How many Mac minis would it take <laughs> to, pr to produce the same result that I'm getting is kind of my question. Uh, What's the yeah? Well, we're we, talking uh, about? literally, we don't know the answer because that information is obfuscated from us because only OpenAI knows that answer. So right. the only way we would know that answer is if we use an open source model. And so okay. that's what I mean by saying around like a like a like when you get up into yeah. the seventy, you just can't you yeah. can't reasonably run those on on any kind of arc first of all mac minis so we're talking about of hundreds of mac minis then for something yeah yeah like we're talking yeah. about actually not even uh cpus but gpus that's where this right. whole gpu conversation comes uh, into play and, yeah yeah you want to run on the nvidia h100s and and yeah. and that's why there's a space race for all that is because you know open ai needs like tens of thousands of those got it, got it, got be able to okay so that's the server it. stuff so the on device obviously it's not going to be able to handle the same kind of a model well, um, so so what with what why this is meaningful is because imagine a slider, Matt, where capabilities of the model and the compute necessary kind of mm -hmm. like slide in this continuum. Sure. So you want to find the sweet spot. If you want to find a model that runs on your phone, whether it's an M3 Apple Silicon or whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you're moving that slider pretty far to the left on capabilities. So we see evidence of this on this chart right here where it says basically the Apple on device when it comes to summarization mm -hmm. and composition of text is akin to Mistral, which mm -hmm. is a, mm -hmm. open, a French open source model, uh, 7B, or Gemma, which is Gemini's, uh, and Phi 3 is Microsoft's uh, 7B. I personally thought they were probably closer to the 3B model, so I was kind of impressed that they were more than that. But okay. the point is like, they're nowhere close to GPT 3.0, let right. alone 3.5 yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or 4.0. Okay, just so we're yeah. clear on that. So, but it doesn't need to be, right? Because what is it doing? Summarizing text and and, and writing text? Cool. And yeah. again, remember, we we don't use models to answer questions. That's not business use case and that's silly talk. Yeah, so this the server is call. Let's look at the servers. Things. Server, right. on the other hand, so so j just to kind of frame this up, why is this important? Well, you alluded to this earlier that sometimes somewhere in their architecture, they recognize this thing that Matt just asked Siri to do or something like that, right? Right. It's going to need a model 
it's not even talking about compute. It's saying the model Mistral 7B or these 7B models aren't going to be enough for what right. you want to do, right? So we want to kick it off to the server. And so then there's all this sophisticated stuff they do where they, they're, I don't know, they didn't even really reveal it, but it's super private and you're taking your data and it's mm -hmm. sending it up to the server to just perform this one task. And just to be really clear, this is not the role that ChatGPT plays. This is not sending it to the open AI models. I actually right. left the first presentation thinking that might be the case. So in that case, it is more akin to the performance of as as those who can see on screen gpt4 turbo which is not the 40 it's the the predecessor to that right yeah mix draw mix of experts which is 8 by 22 b that's that to give you an idea that's about the maximum mix draw that one actually the 22 billion parameter that one's about what you can probably run on like an aws uh, excel with uh, some oh. gpu access to give got you it, an idea so, um, but even on, so that's summarization of text and then composition, it, Apple says, well, we can't quite beat GPT-4 Turbo at this. But I mean, but we're talking we're, about 9.5 you know, versus 9.7. Those you know, numbers, by the way, are so close to each other. But... Those are just whatever Apple came up with for their right. metrics. So it's more about right. the ranking, like where they're close to than, than anything else. Right. So, so I guess my, here's my big question on this Apple server. So Apple has server farms with some kind of a computer that you can't buy that has Apple chips in it, CPU and GPU chips. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, basically. So, yes. So the server farms that Apple has been using all along or whatever, maybe have not been using the same kind of machines or the, uh, that are, that other server farms are using. I guess I should, I don't know, maybe that's something other people know, but I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I don't think this, I'm not even entirely sure this is public knowledge prior to this their, yeah. yeah, this announcement. I don't, I don't have any evidence of that at all. Um, uh, and by the way, the last thing I'll show you on comparing is just, mm -hmm. um, they did another thing, win, lose, or tie, which is a, a unique way to benchmark also super this. super confusing, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> super, so they're basically just saying, Again, these are the way to look at a chart like this is just to simply say what how these models perform closer to what models we can get our hands on and test already. Sure. And that's the Mistral 7Bs and the 3.5 turbos and stuff like that. So so I would say I'm not like dejected in any way by these being substandard to the the frontier models that are available yeah. in the cloud. I think all of that shows that they're right on par. Basically. They're on par. Yeah. yeah they're I mean here's here here's how I'll, I'll put a bow on that you just don't need you don't need a gpt4 omni for everything you do okay <laughs> <laughs> why else would i i mean what else you know well if you wanted I to don't do switch reading, to some other model well un understood but i mean like if you're just saying um summarize the, these meeting notes you can right. do that with gpt4 3.0 and alone, get, get them much much faster yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and cheaper yeah. as well too, right? So these yeah. are all factors in there. So here's, I so let me let's talk about some stuff that like, I dug a little deep. So my first thought was like, oh, cool. Okay, how do I get access to these models? Right? Like, can is there an API? Because like all the other, you know, OpenAI announces a new one, and later that day you just go to their documentation API documentation and figure out how to update it. Which, by the way. Um, allows us to swap out new model versions on announcements within like within an hour. Like the the when GPT four Turbo went to GPT four Omni, mm -hmm. we updated our Intuition platform within forty five minutes Whoa. to the new model. It's so you're just so, so APIs. Like, yeah, so swapping out to a new model is not a thing. Not any kind of a thing. No. Backwards compatibility. Not at all. As a matter of yeah, fact, when know. three three point five or when three went to three point five or no, when 3.5 went to GPT-4, I was on an airplane flying home and I was like, oh my God, I want to record a video of this when I get home. I got home and within an hour, I'd updated all my testing things to the new one. And and actually, no, that was three point. It basically, it but, was they don't, the, but they didn't deprecate the old one, right? The old ones stick around for a good long they, time. No, I did they? a uh, I, I did a study and the least amount of time they gave you for deprecation between announcement to deprecation was six months. And to give you an idea, um, that's how when uh, QuickBooks Online did a deprecation of some payment uh, API that they did, mm -hmm. they gave six months as well too. Some some APIs give like twelve months, yeah. but the minimum I found as a comparison was six months. And OpenAI okay. has never given you less time than that. The big one though that I think people point to is, and actually that in the anecdote where I was flying home and I wanted to test was actually when the um, 
the completion endpoint changed to the chat endpoint. So it mm. really was kind of a fundamental change in the structure of your APIs. But even that one, like literally I got home, sat here hmm. in less than so an hour. This is extremely good news then for, for people doing this. So so I, tell me, I'm not sure what you were in the middle of, but I want to kind of finish up the, what takeaways you had from the Apple announcements. Okay. What's your my, feeling? my takeaways were there's a gap in the and then and then we'll talk about how I think us Claire's folks can get our mitts on these things and what that means to us. So my takeaways though were this: there's a huge void in AI for personal AI, a, a literal personal assistant. And I'm not talking so much about the fact that we can talk to Siri and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That that's that's the interface for this, right? Um, I I would say that. Apple nailed it because they filled the void of my personal information uh, and I get to use that from an AI standpoint. As a yeah. matter of fact, um, I think this is the role that Siri was always meant to play. Um, you know, they, it, they, they, oh, stop. I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> I got about three series now responding to me. Uh, not, we're not quite there somewhere. yet, but, but the point being that so we got Siri and we could ask it questions. And then for a year, we thought that was the coolest thing ever. And that's what AI meant to most of us. That was like yeah. 12 years ago, by the way, just oh <laughs> for some perspective. Yeah. And then like two years later, just all of us turned it off and none of it. We were so frustrated by its uselessness, like, you know, giving me a list of web searches. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah. it just didn't make any sense. I know. But but here's here's and maybe this can. Te so now it knows everything about me. As a matter of fact, um. Ever since the announcement, I've just been logging all these examples of when hopefully the Siri with uh, personal intel, uh, personal context, the Apple yeah. intelligence yeah. Uh, version will be more useful. Like last night I was with my wife and we were walking out of um, we, we were walking out of a baseball game and we were like, oh, we should call so and so to do the blah, blah, blah. blah. And I was like, I don't remember when she said she was coming back from her vacation. Like I should absolutely right. be able to say, Siri, just go. Was there the yeah. email what or text or whatever? Go from, find yeah. out when so and so is going to come back and then whatever. Right. That is what we're going to be able to do. And that yeah, I think yeah, is yeah. a void that they filled. Did they say from a business computing standpoint, like look out, open AI and Gemini, like here comes Apple. No, none of that happened. And nor does it did it have to. I don't think it had to happen for for us to to care about that. So, right. so great. I don't. What was your reaction, by the way? Uh, that so, I give you a chance. I I mean I I was kind of impressed by a lot of the stuff for sure. I mean I thought that, hey they've got it they're on the right track. <clears throat> the the single example they gave for Siri was so stupid. <laughs> it was like come on man. The the example was the uh, flight thing. With give me, the mom give me directions to no. It was like give me directions to. Uh, you know, Smith Rock State Park or whatever. Oh, wait, no, I mean Smith Creek State Park. Oh, that was so dumb. Yeah, I'm sorry. That one was like, I was like, oh, no, you had me for a second. And now I'm yeah. like, oh, no, that's even worse. Than what. So, yeah. I mean, all and by the way, that was a semantic use case. Like, and I think if I bring that down to Claire's people level, one of the biggest frustrations we've had with um, lexical searching was that like the John Jonathan thing, you know, or the yeah. DR period versus doctor thing. Well, semantic that's searching, semantics can help us with that, right? And that's a tease for something that's coming yep, up here. It is. Um, so here's what I think, just from a consumer, Apple consumer, you know, fanboy standpoint, what this means. And then we'll talk about the Claire's thing and then we can get into that very tease that you just meant. Um, here's where it's a big deal is... Not only does Apple have all your personal context and does it have this infrastructure for intelligence, but it also, what they were really revealing, and I think if I'm going to give them some credit, why there's no dates about when any of this is going to be available. And it seems like maybe they just said, oh, let's catch up and give an announcement, but we're not going to give any dates because this could take a year. This was a developer conference. So what they were saying was, look, here's a bunch of tools for all the developers who have apps to go out and build Apple intelligence into your apps. What does that mean for us? There is this concept earlier this year that was referred to as large action models. Um, remember, I think it was like um, uh, the in, in, right after New Year's. What's the conference in Vegas? I'm sorry. I'm such an idiot. Um, well, there's the name the, show for music. <laughs> CS, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show? 
Yeah, consumer electronics. Yeah. So the the big runaway hit of yeah. consumer electronics was the rabbit device. And on and Matt, like I just I the second I saw it, I was just like, everybody just stop it. And and you know, I'm a bit of a cynic, but what yeah. it was was this little brick that was basically open a uh open AI, but with the ability to like run actions. Uh there were yeah. two reasons why I was so dismissive about that. Well, A, you can have your own we can do act we can have open ai run a api yeah. endpoints already yeah but the real reason why is because it was this brick well first of all it sold out it was the most popular thing yeah. people were I've, freaking I've out just, <laughs> okay well don't because it yeah, was yeah, yeah. a complete waste of time okay and the reason why it was a waste of time is because you would have had to carry two things in your pocket now this dumb little rabbit brick and then your phone yeah. what apple just did well first of all Literally anyone who has one of those rabbits go th throw it in the garbage. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. And here's why, because now well, Apple you got to wait till fall though. <laughs> well, but the point is yeah. it was always coming. It was always yeah. going to be that you could do the same thing. And what is the, this that we're talking about? What yeah, we're what talking is about is um, not only be able to, it, it, it ha it's going to have access to all these apps and it can orchestrate these things that we're talking about. So when we're talking about like looking into my emails, my text message to see mm -hmm. when our friend is getting back from her vacation, mm -hmm. those are all Apple apps. The big thing is going to be when you can do things like saying, um, hey, Matt's coming over for dinner on Saturday. Go check um, open table to see if our favorite restaurant has uh, mm -hmm. availability at 10 p.m. Right. If not, then go find off of their menu, our favorite appetizer, and then go into Instacart, another third-party app, mm -hmm. and put in all the ingredients to make this at home, fill up a cart, right. and have it scheduled to deliver to my house. That Apple can't, couldn't yet reach into those applications. Now right. it can. That's what um, loosely is what app intense is. They're essentially um, APIs that, uh, API wires that are hanging out of all our apps that we can build. So there's a, a mm. bunch of them. There's right, a right. natural language API, a vision API, and a speech API that they announced it uh, that we have availability to. Not we, but like app developers do. And I want to be clear, we're not actually app developers. I know we like, you know, yeah, like hijack the term app. We're relational which database developers, but anyway. Probably yeah. should have never done, yeah. So app developers using Swift can do this. So what can Claris do? Well, aside from the natural language endpoints, the vision endpoints, and the speech API endpoints, mm -hmm. which are literally API endpoints, currently my understanding is, and I'm, I'm getting into the area where I could be wrong in a bunch of stuff and I just haven't had time to, um, like, rabbit hole, sorry about the rabbit device, but rabbit hole <laughs> into these things. Sure. If they're just wide open endpoints and we can just connect to them from FileMaker, cool, done. But I don't have any evidence of that right now. Yeah. I believe okay. these are through Swift, but here's something amazing. Oh my God. Okay. And you, you can laugh at me when I'm totally wrong about but this, but let's just have some fun and pretend that I actually discovered something. So, so look at these models on screen. I'm showing a list of models whisper, uh, which is uh, open AI's open source model that allows that uh, translates speech into text inputs and, and, text into speech. That's how we actually talk with the app, right? And that is totally available for us as FileMaker users to, it's a open source model. You can just go on GitHub and use. Stable Diffusion, of course, is the Diffusion uh, model creator one. The rest of them, Mistral, uh, Llama, Falcon, those are all open source models. We saw a couple of those on those benchmark lists. Those are ones that you can go download and run locally on your device. And I, I would say before you think open source is all like, you don't have to pay for those token wise, but you definitely have to pay yeah. for compute. And then there's Clip, Quinn, and Open LM. What are mm -hmm. those? Well, go read the article about things that Apple dropped before this announcement. Those are models that they dropped and that are also available. So what do all these things have in common? Matt, we can use, or, well, we'll be able to use CoreML has a tool called CreateML. Okay. We have talked, we've danced around this topic in the past because um, the, it, you, in, in FileMaker, yeah. you can go train your own model and then at the end, compress it into this thing that's called a .ml model file. Does that sound familiar? That's um, been from because, the early day stuff, like before the recent crop of AI stuff. FileMaker 19. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Core ML stuff. So yeah. the dot ml mo model files are meaningful to Claire's folks because you can take those models after you create them and drop them into a FileMaker container field and with some supported native script steps with FileMaker, ex like run them, make them available in that user's session. 
huge deal, yeah. right? Chris, is this the first podcast you and I have done since FileMaker 2024 shipped? <laughs> I think it actually is. <laughs> No, Which, we, we did one with did Ronnie. One? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm we thinking did because a, I a huge. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I did it at the conference because our anyway because my brain was was connecting things weirdly because of uh, our next topic a, when I'm talking. Yeah, about Yeah, we did the, an, a 90 minute one <laughs> that everyone should check out because Ronnie Rios, the product Killed manager it. of FileMaker 2024, came and yeah. went through line by line of all the different features. So yes, all right, I know fine. you just teased me. So what does this mean? Because this is a big deal. Okay. They said that now you can take any one of those models that we just li listed off, run them through the core ML tools, which is all, which is both the, the create ML tool that is part of Xcode. Mm -hmm. And also there's um, a, uh, a command line interface that you can run from within a FileMaker script, script to run core ML tools mm -hmm. that will take those models and make them into a .ml model file, Matt. So imagine if this means I can actually take Mistral 7B, turn it into an ML model file and drop it into a container field in FileMaker and run that, send data to it yeah. and get data back. If, yeah. if this discovery is what I think it is, oh my God. And that's gonna be Apple only? Cause some of the core ML stuff was Apple only. It all is. So with, <laughs> yeah. so, so well, I guess a I was thinking like a, Mac versus iOS, but yeah, Apple. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. a little bucket of water on that, but yes. Um, I, I think people need to know that, that the reason that we don't hear a lot about, um, Hormel probably is because it's Apple only, yep. but get, but, but think about this instead on device, you've got a FileMaker app that you run a run through the SDK and manage in an MDM mm -hmm. for business use cases on device that currently has access to these create ML models. So you've seen demonstrations. Um, I got a bunch of stuff on the internet of like uh, creating uh, image or uh, uh, vision models that recognize mm -hmm. things and you point your phone at it in your FileMaker app and you go, what is this thing? And it goes, oh, it's a spark plug. And here's the record in your FileMaker database yep. for that. We've been able to That's... do that for five or six years. Right? Yeah, I remember that demo. They actually so use a spark plug. Im imagine that actual thing, but using Mistral or Falcon or mm -hmm. Whisper or you know some of the other models that we just looked at. That's yeah. how I think people should be looking at this. And I think that is potentially very profound, whether it's, just for Apple or not, you know, it could also just be yeah. for devices, right? Uh, yeah. That also communicate with FileMaker server through non-Apple uh, environments. So uh, TBD on what that means. And, and by the way, just, you know, and then we'll get to your announcement. So to put a bow on this, the fact that um, CoreML is Apple only is what got me to go look for cloud-based API models mm -hmm. in the first place. Because mm -hmm. I was doing things like summarization and and, and uh, sentiment analysis and keyword extraction. And I thought, well, I can only do this on Mac. So I bet you there's a, a cloud service out there that does it. And yeah. oh, great, they have API access. Cool. So sorry, Cormel, I don't need you anymore. I can do um, cross-platform uh, yeah. model integration this way. And that's ultimately what led me to uh, GPT-3 as well right. too. So thank yeah. you, Coromel, for not being cross-platform. Okay. <laughs> So right. lots to check out. Uh, check out the link in the show notes of uh, some of the stuff we've been talking about here. Okay. So Matt. next topics. Um, so I was at the .fmp conference and that, uh, which happened in, Ber I think, Berlin. in Berlin, in Berlin, which happened two days after 2024 shipped. So all these people yeah, had I... sessions and they couldn't, pub they couldn't list what it was for. But a lot of them knew that what was going to happen. They didn't know when it was going to happen, but they were able to actually change their session description and then just and then show the new stuff. It was awesome. It was like such perfect timing. Um, yeah, I think then, actually, um, so they updated their, this per what you were talking, the timeline you were talking about before, they were able yeah. to up, update all their stuff when the announcement came out, but it was still a week yeah. later that you went to the conference, which is still like a week. Are you kidding me? Everybody had all this stuff already. And no, it was because really only a couple days. The first session was like, I think literally two or three days after. It wasn't like a whole week or something. Yeah. Three days after the launch, you and I did our interview with right. Ronnie Rios and yeah, you had And I was at the conference. In. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. You were yeah. at the conference. Perfect. I did that now from we're putting Berlin. it all together. And this is kind of why I forgot it because I was 
in the middle like we did that one and that was like you know three percent of the stuff coming at me that week because of course all these other sessions right um so and by the way you did some great interviews if people want to look at our bonus episode yep, from last previous. week you can talk to some folks about that but is yeah, by the way was, was that good. the last it Berlin was. conference why yeah. what's i don't so understand the, um the guy who runs it actually the very last uh uh recording of the last episode he talks about it exactly why but he had been running it for i think 12 years and all alone like it's just his deal his baby mm. um and that's a lot right so the other Agreed. conferences the other conferences that happen in europe have teams behind them uh or even like multiple companies for the engage you conference and the engage you conference last year had 200 plus people and they're aiming for 300 people this year wow um uh and so that's it by far the largest english-speaking conference in europe no anyway so at, at this conference i i there was so much awesome AI stuff. It was great. And it was a lot of other really good things as well. Uh, Kevin Frank was there showing some amazing stuff. That guy's kind of smart. <laughs> um, what, uh, um, what was your, uh, what was your favorite like takeaway? Oh um, man. Just like. It's too many things are kind of jumping in my head right now. Um, I think it was actually some of the simplicity some some of the stuff that looked simpler that maybe isn't so quite so simple for the new script steps that we have in 2024, mm -hmm. right? The the embed and the uh, yep. and the perform semantic find, yeah. Right, those two are the key. And there's one other one which is like basically set essentially it up, configure companions with each other. Yeah. Like you need yeah, you one configure to it, and that's the, the one you send the username and password. Um, and that's the only time you send the password. And then the, the subsequent calls either uh, either embed or mm -hmm. do a find. The embedding is an API call and all the perform finds happen locally. So basically seeing all those demos um, and used in different ways and the short, how short of a script you can make was, mm. was kind of the big thing that I saw. Cause, and I saw many different uses of it. There's some great discussions. Um, but then I've been... I guess there's, I'll just tie this into the next thing, right? Please. Um, uh, so, and for some context, we've been talking yeah. about the idea of semantic search in, in a lot of the episodes. Yeah. And one of the personal challenges is, well, you're, you're very well known for having a search, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to call it a product, but it's a, you know, a, well, it was a at one point file. it was for sale, right? So, okay. gotcha. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a completely, uh, well, it's called FM search results. I just, just call it search results now. It's version seven is the most recent release. It's just available for free on my website, navar.training. Um, I I still have yet to see a database that I think would not benefit from having it in there because it can search across all the tables and show you results on one page. And now were you originally doing this in the like virtual list era originally? Or yeah, uh, what the was first, the evolution of your technique? The first version of it actually was a virtual list. Okay. Uh, actually, Kinda I don't know if it was one. that. No, it was even before that, actually. I think it was actually repeating global field with the display. So the search stuff I've... happens at the back end, but then there's different widgets to display the data. So it I was feel a virtual... like I saw you. Did you present at the uh, DevCon in San Francisco? Yeah. On this? I did. I think I saw your session and I it, and it was maybe the, I thought then you were at the virtual list level. It was like the first time I saw somebody talk about virtual yeah. list personally. It actually, it still is for the the current version. Um, okay. because it's a, but it's, it's showing JSON data. So you can basically take the JSON object and show it with whatever way you want, but the virtual mm. list works really well. You know, a, a few hundred records into a table that have no data in it. And it just basically grabs a line number and says, show this information. And when you click on the line, it knows that it knows the data of, that you're viewing and the metadata of like, what table is that? What's the record number? And then navigates to that particular thing. So that's, what's, that's, what's really cool about it. You can search across Everything and it's wicked fast. Okay. Amazing. That's right. That's right. I just dated myself by saying wicked fast. Um, <laughs> well, you also dated search because you were talking right. about virtual lists. So so what would be the modern, and we've talked about this in our conversations, the modern adaptation of that would be to integrate semantic search somehow, yes. right? Well, and, see, and you took that's the exactly what I'm challenge doing. for that. That's what you, the gauntlet you threw down and I, I picked it up um, is to uh, to basically begin rewriting it to in, in addition to the other one to use semantic search awesome. so or semantic find yeah um so uh yeah i so guess technically it would be semantic find because we call yeah. searches finds and filemaker 
So I have a lot of questions. I would actually like to have some conversations with people about the best way to do this. But kind of what I'm thinking is this. To, in order for semantic find to work, you have to have an embedding, which is a, you have to stick a blob of text into a container field, which you is the You need embedding. to first convert a blob of text yeah. into actual embeddings, which are mathematical vectors that yes. represent that yeah. in a multidimensional space. So imagine, if you will, a, uh, a a typical CRM type system. You have a company record, which has four mm -hmm, employees. Mm -hmm. There's 20 invoices. There's a bunch of notes. And there's, you know, maybe just that, right? Okay, um, okay. So you you take that record and basically create a JSON object of everything that, get, that has meaning embedded in it, right? So you can use types of JSON that actually say, these are invoices. Um, and you can you maybe even have some other stuff in there too. And the, the meaning you're talking it. about is you're providing context in the structure of the JSON object. Yes, exactly. By the naming convention, which is, I didn't think about, but that's kind of cool. So uh, it's actually a little which... bit of a pain to do that for a whole entire set of records. You have to kind of loop and there's some wild stuff. So, oh, because you're constructing an object, they're not just right. like go search for these results. You're actually taking fields from very potentially different contexts, actually, but you're assembling yeah. them together as one JSON object. So the way that I'm the way that I'm thinking that this was going to work is this: um, in each table, when you edit a record or create a record, I think really edit because when you create, there's nothing in it. It would okay. um, it would. Uh, create a JSON object for that information with all the nice stuff, and then go to another table, a table dedicated for for um, search. The, the that's the only place where your container field lives. And mm. either create the or update container a record. Field, just to be clear, the container field, which is the, the FileMaker embedding. 2024 binary yes. that allows you to store the vectors, which is yes. very meaningful because. If it was text that you were doing, your indexes would be so insane and your performance would be ridiculous. So they have to be these new types of containers, Actually, which is not a really big that deal. much bad. So it's, it's, if you store it as text, it's worse. The file's bigger, but it's not so bad. It's just definitely the best practice is for sure to do it as, as a container. If you had like a, a database with like a thousand meeting transcripts in it, yeah. And you wanted to be, search within them. I get it. And you turned on text, right. like it would be. Well, so the, would, other, so the other, so the other idea for my approach is, uh, so oh, but, what we're going to do is containers. Is, not not throwing bucket of water on. Yeah, I'm saying yeah, these yeah. containers are a big deal. That's yeah, they're huge. a big deal. It's awesome. Yeah, definitely. So, so, um, so it goes into this dedicated table that's flat. It's going to have one record for every record in every table in your database that you want to search against. Awesome. Okay. So in my example, you'd have one, it would have a record for the company, it'd have five records for the contacts, 50 records for the invoices, and 30 records for the for the follow-up contact notes or whatever. Okay, sure. And then also, you know, there may be an address table and a phone number table and some other little and small ones. Yeah, like basically child table. Yeah, exactly. The, and yeah. um, and then maybe the little tiny ones, it doesn't necessarily have to have a record for each thing, but for, for like a, an invoice, and all of its line items, that would be like a record. You'd have a JSON object that would have the information. And you're then interestingly, you could, create, you could create an array for the small ones, as you're saying, like the addresses yes. and phone numbers. You could just do an array or something. Yeah. So basically, you make a one context. JSON object. And interestingly, the way it works in 2024 is you have to have a field in the table that has the JSON thing, or what, uh, you should do it in JSON, not text format, um, that you have to then uh, embed. So the field and the embedding container have to both be a field. You cannot, you cannot, unless I'm mistaken, embed from a from a variable. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I don't. Yeah, you know, maybe you say... can. I did it with a set of records. There's two different ways to do it. You can embed a single record, or you can do embed a, embed a set of records and a loop through and do them in, in chunks. So, okay, you so were, once... you're hoping that you had variables so that you could loop through and just create one variable to embed rather than yeah. have to do individual records, basically. Yeah, so so my thought is, so then when you want to do a, a search, it would navigate to this table because another key thing about, about uh, semantic search is you must do the search from the table that you're in the same context. If you do a related search, it kills the, pro the performance because the it'll automatically do it server side and it'll be, mm. you know, hundreds of times or whatever faster because the server yeah. has insanely fast access to all of the data in those container fields. I was thinking that for it to hmm. read the data in the container fields, it would be slow. No, it's surprisingly fast, except if you have like 5 million records in your, in your set that you're searching against, that's going to be slow. 
So but, you're saying the preference is local versus server as opposed to our normal thinking where we do PSOS and we push it off to the server because yeah. it has more processing power. Normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. So okay. so one of the features that I had in search results is before you do a search, it actually determines what it is that you typed in. So if you type in one, two, three, four, five, it goes, oh, that's an integer. That could either be an invoice number or an account number um, mm, or clever. a dollar amount. So I'm only going to go look in those places. I'm Smart. not going to go look for, I'm not going to look for one, two, three, four, five in a text field that contains notes. If Great. you type in something that's obviously an email address, it's going to look only in places where an email address can live. If you type in something that it, that it, that looks like a name because there's a name lookup table, it looks only in the place where names exist. And then also does name substitution type stuff. If you type something that doesn't, doesn't match any of those things, and there's several, there's date, date range, integer, decimal, blah, blah, blah. Um, then it goes, okay, well, now I have to up the game and I'll just assume it's text, but we mm -hmm. could even, so, and then I could do a search for text and which says, which means I can either do a lexical search or mm -hmm. a semantic search, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I can also look at only a small set of records. So for example, if I, um, you know, the, the, the code that runs it doesn't necessarily have to look at all a million records in that table. <clears throat> it can say, oh, I, I know that what you're looking for, you started your search from an invoice layout. So I'm not going to look at the entire set. Just the related find, invoices. Yeah. So that one of the, one of the okay. other uh, rec records in that, one of the fields in that table, that's a dedicated table would maybe be like table number or name or something. So then I would say, okay, find all the ones that are index that are uh, um, invoices, which would be fast and then search only yep. against those. Or yeah, all we, the ones that are invoices we or line items or whatever. <clears throat> well, we were kidding around about uh, in our context episode earlier this mm -hmm. year where we said it's not the it's yeah. not the context that you think, <laughs> but you're actually doing a very clever use of the context that you do think it is, like us FileMaker people context, to establish what where you're then doing your semantic searches. And I think that's actually yeah. sneaky brilliant. We'll there, see. So. I've, I've had, I haven't done that much testing on it yet. But then the other thing I'm thinking is what if what if the user types something in that they're now going to expect, which is um, <clears throat> who, who are my best three sales reps in quarter four last year? You know, mm, that's mm -hmm, not something, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the data is there. It has the invoices, but I don't yep. know. I don't know how that's going to work because that's not a search. That's like a, report that's, that's a, like a that's a reasoning well that's a reasoning. I, here i have a thought for you here's my initial instinct we talked earlier about um personal uh context mm -hmm. and like when you're writing your prompts to speak to language models you got to tell it who you are another thing you have to do is tell it who's going to consume your information we mm -hmm. often refer to those as audience personas right and um and also then the rest of that is where you're providing instruction and and giving it Mm -hmm. information about what is a meaningful result one of the things so one of the things that I'm, I'm zeroing in on you said best so um we literally have customers who've come back to us with this and uh, i've seen people out in the wild talking about this mm -hmm. and they go i just asked i don't know chat gpt what's the best you know mexican mm -hmm. restaurant near me or something like that the problem yeah. is the first thing these models are going to think is well what do you think the best is right and so that so I don't think that's a miss. I think that's an opportunity mm -hmm. to define within your either your user persona and or your audience persona what best means to them. Right. And when yeah. we're writing user personas, we will literally say the way they utilize their data is they think that this is the biggest. Like we did a um, uh, we did a a, a a GPT for fantasy sports where I connected to this you know this fantasy football a mm -hmm. API that I have, and instead of saying who's the best player, I defined on this like page of instruction what best means this is better in this case this column when it the higher is the better mm -hmm, in this mm -hmm. column it's this and in, in mm -hmm. whenever you're deciding between lower these the two, better sure exactly yeah. so in your case you could have profound amazing things happen if you are able to define what best means for yep. example yeah exactly. and we do we all know that because we know what our users workflows are and what they care about mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff so um yeah i think that's so, an opportunity okay so the embedding that does mm -hmm. the JSON. This is the other one of the other key parts. Well, you have to do one AI call that actually, well, that's one API call that you have to do that sends that information out and creates the embedding and then puts it back in. You can actually have that done on the server on your loan. It could be in-house um, and you could run that on 
yeah, your FileMaker server or some other server in your building. But you, but it's also super easy to do with the with the uh, uh, OpenAI API. Yes. So, and I, well, I will say just for some context mm -hmm. from out in the real world on that, um, like we just did a, uh, for one of our FileMaker customers, mm -hmm. a massive embeddings. It, was, it had nothing to do with search. It had to do with pairing and matching. Um, I won't reveal what they were doing, but it involved like, you know, 2000 records in a FileMaker database that mm -hmm. had huge, a big document that we extracted text from with the language model. And then we embedded that big block of text, kind of yep. like what we were just talking about yep, before. Yep. And we used OpenAI's uh, large, which is... Um, the reason we did that is because it was so much text. We needed the dimensions. Yeah. Like you have embedding models that have like 300 features or dimensions, mm -hmm. um, which means uh, we did a thought experiment where I said, Hey, define a bunch of features of the word soccer. And you gave me like five. Mm -hmm. And so then we said, well, a language model can do 300 or up to 4,000. And, and that that's what, what, why we use embedding models instead mm -hmm. of humans to do this. Right. But on the 8,000 dimension, embeddings model against like 2600 records it took like two hours to run yeah. that on a server so like like these yeah. are no joke and but it didn't matter because we were doing a set it and forget it and then we can yeah. embed one record at a time in the future and it only takes seconds not hours right yeah this i, I think i i don't know how I, long i ran it for but it was much much faster than that but when I did the, my but the point is writings. If you were to use like a um, a haiku, which is mm -hmm. the three parameter uh, billion parameter version of the Claude Opus, for example, which is what we did, it takes minutes then. So the point is right. the model, the embedding model selection you're making not only has to do with speed, but the number of dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important thing that people need to take very seriously yeah. when they're making those decisions. Absolutely. So another concept that I have is since there has to be this one API call, well, why don't I just do an, an um, why don't I take that blob of JSON and do a API call that says, take this JSON and using what you know about me, create a bigger JSON blob that describes exactly what this is optimized for semantic search. Great. Then you take that and you embed it. Mm -hmm. And now you have, now you have a, a much, much better thing uh, to search against, I think. So this and is and you're talking about using what you know about me is your user persona that you crafted for that yes, individual user. Exactly, exactly. Or the Brilliant. system. Yeah, or the system. So this is work, right? This is uh, yeah, so... by the way, user personas are the system for that one user mm -hmm. of your system of your application's API call. Um, you know, a lot yeah. of people just like put in that's where they put you are a helpful assistant, but you can put, I mean we have so many tokens available. You can put yeah. tons of information about this person. By the way, you could, to your point, imagine if you said you're searching against a customer table for invoice information and mm -hmm. and you know who the user is. It's Chris is in your system and he's about to execute this search. Guess what? Else? You also have a log of the last 1500 searches yep. that Chris did. That's true. You could You true. could actually incorporate those as context to determine to make some of the decisions that you're talking about, like he's often found that these are the type, he only cares about California customers or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Like you can right. model and provide that information about me into that search in the manner that you're talking about. And that's a big deal. Uh, not with the perform semantic find feature. So there's maybe other ways you could do that, but I don't think you can send all that other information. At least I just I haven't played with it that that far yet. You mean to embed or to? Well, the embedding to the, can to know language that, but the model. embedding is there one time, right? So you're embedding the information for a company. Unless, record. unless you're embedding, unless you're embedding that one array of yeah. uh, log on domain on the fly, and then coming back and doing it. And by the way. That's how chatbots work. So just, yeah. so here, think about this for a second. So okay. a chatbot with retrieval, mm -hmm. what you, you've you already embedded a whole bunch of documents, like a bunch of HR documents. You did sure. that weeks ago, yep. and maybe that's a set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. But then when the user is asking a question and they type the question into the chatbot, you're actually embedding that question real quick. Boom, sure. shooting it off and embedding it and then doing right, a right, semantic right. search. So it's the same thing you're talking about. You oh, can say, yes, as they're asking course. a question, you just go, boom, go go embed that. Then you're, you could do yeah. your semantic search based on that. You're absolutely right. I forgot. I, I I didn't connect that, but you're right. So before you do the search, the 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 string that you're searching against. Because um, there's two embeddings. There's the user's yeah, be, input or command right. that's being embedded. And then there's the, the, re, the reservoir of stuff you're, you're querying against in, yep. in your vector. So. Yep, yep, yep. So this is going to be some really fun experimentation. With search results, like the, the way that I, what really, really makes me happy when I do uh, stuff for the community is 
not just to do something that's technically cool, but to do it in a way that's really light and fast and easy to integrate. Mm. That's where that's most neat. of the work for like FM log and FM search results went. Um, so that you can integrate it in an hour and then it just works, you know? Anyway, so that's my goal. Amazing. Well, so you're speaking at a conference this fall in Europe somewhere. Yeah, two of them. So October two in Rome, November in uh, Sweden, I think. And these are Alma. the ones that you're going to uh, sh uh, show in your presentation. Yeah. So I'll be talking about this. Um, and I'll also, I'm also doing classes uh, like a day, the day before the conference, I'm going to be doing a paid class. You can oh, yeah, that's right. That's to. right. You should uh, put that in the show notes, yep. uh, by the way. Yep. And um and a quick couple plugs and then I'll just end with like a little two minute yeah, uh, yeah, presentation have, here. Yeah, we have two updates from you, really. Uh, yeah. So the, the Claristotle um, Learning Initiative and also your intuition B3, which I yeah, just Yes. So um Clar <laughs> Claristotle, which is what the Claris AI Learning Initiative, we we somewhat tongue in cheek, but I think in a fun we, way named it Claristotle. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um so uh that was a shower thought. I was just like, what should I oh my god, Claristotle. Yeah. So um on you, July you used to live right over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On uh, July 12th, we're having a follow-up. Uh, if you look in the show notes, you can join the Discord channel where we have active conversations about it. You can see our initial mm -hmm. kickoff that we did last month and see a lot of the conversation that everybody's having. People are already registering for the July 12th, 8 a.m. Pacific mm -hmm. Standard Time um, uh, meeting. It's open to anybody that wants to come and talk about it. Mostly what we're going to talk about is did anything that Apple announced and, you know, our Claire's friends mm -hmm. will be there, mm -hmm. too. They've been very mm -hmm. supportive about this. Is there anything that we could use in this initiative there? And and there'll be some Claire's folks there to, to provide their thoughts on how this might work. Um, and really, we just want to keep the conversation going. So I strongly encourage people to check it out. Go to the show notes. Mm -hmm. Go. It, it's on the, the, the community. We've been talking about just Claristotle. There's no other term. Yeah. <laughs> the, anywhere you look for it, you'll find the, the Discord information. Th yeah. That's part one. Got it. Part well, two actually, is. Before, before, you, before you go to the part two, when are we going to see a proof of concept of that we can start playing with? Well, so. Thank you for that. That's an important question because what we're actually trying to create with this is first step is to create a a, a community driven knowledge base of uh, a higher level of Claris related FileMaker related knowledge than the latent mm -hmm. intelligence that's in the model. We have to do that first. And so we're talking about doing that as a knowledge base that we can then go vectorize and make it available to different models. So once that knowledge base is there and once we have the ability for people to take their own models or their own applications or whatever to go have access to that knowledge and then to embellish the latent knowledge within the models, there'll be all sorts of products that are coming out of that that are going to be really amazing. So, um, and that's part of what we need to talk about too is like, because we're not really talking about building a model or training a model. We're talking about building a knowledge base. And then what happens after that Thanks. will be very interesting to see what we do with it. Yeah, Maybe someday we fine tune it. with it, but right now it's a knowledge base for vector retrieval. Yep. Um, so that's step one. Um, right. For me, in addition to the Claristotle on July 12th, I am really excited because I'm speaking at a conference in my hometown of Milwaukee next week as we record this. Uh, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and one of the things that uh, was there my whole life is this thing called Summerfest, which is like a music festival, and it it's a big deal in my little town. And a few years ago, they started a tech version of it. They're, they're in partnership with South by Southwest. If you remember, South by mm -hmm. Southwest was a music festival, and then it became mm -hmm. a movie and tech one. They're trying to follow in the same footsteps at the scale of Milwaukee. And I'm so proud to be able to go to my hometown and talk about AI. I'm doing a refresh, a very significant refresh of the session that I did at Engage, where I was just profiling a bunch of real world deployed AI things. O only a few of those I'm showing again. And I have a whole new set. I have a whole new hour, you know, kind of as like, like comedians uh, talk about. I have tons of content and a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. that we've been uh, doing since then. And one of those um, things that I'm going to profile, not all of them, but one of them is um, this... Uh, Intuition platform. We're, we just released uh, version three. What the users on YouTube are looking at are uh, custom chatbots. So we have an entire execution environment. This is like code interpreter for, um, you know, the code. Uh, 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 ChatGPT has code mm -hmm. interpreter, which is where you're not just chatting, but you're doing visualizations and Python. So we have over 480 Python libraries available built into this application. You can obviously do chats, you can do visualizations. You, and, and the biggest deal is, is it's multi-user, 
totally secure, meaning every user gets their own user persona. Mm -hmm. All that modeling that I talked about from a user standpoint is happening. Full customization. These are just the prompt template builder that you just saw fly by very quickly yeah. there. But the, the point is it's all connected to your live data sources. So unlike with Code Interpreter, where you have mm -hmm. to upload a, a spreadsheet to be able to yep. um, to be able to interact with it, we're connected to like right now. What you're looking at is uh, somebody connecting to their entire FileMaker suite mm -hmm. of applications through Dappy in this case, right? So mm -hmm. what we're able to do is is uh, containerize this and drop this into people's uh, work environments and allow them to inter keep all their workflows the same. We're not introducing new stuff. That you have a new app that you have to work with or anything, you can actually build this functionality right into your existing FileMaker systems, your SQL systems. You have access to API data, Damn. all multi user, all totally secure, SOC 2 compliant, um, ISO uh, compliant, all the security checkboxes are checked, and model hot swapping. We uh, we're able to add the GPT-4 Omni within 45 minutes of its release with this. And so that meant, and then we pushed that out to all of our uh, all of our customers that are using this as an environment. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to think of it, when I say environment and execution environment, think of it as it's a operating system that you can run apps on, right? So we all know operating systems. We all know apps. Ours are um, an environment that you run assistance on. So we're looking at a training assistant that, that a user is connected to an actual FileMaker database with a bunch of FileMaker data. And they were able to ask, give me a chart that shows the progression of training and give me um, all the sessions completed by certain individuals. Like this was all and then you don't have to mm -hmm. say you want a chart even. You can just say, go find this data and present it to me in the most compelling manner possible. This wow. is our version three. Super excited about it. Um, this can be deployed in the browser assistance that we're showing on YouTube or like we're doing a deployment for inside Zoom chat. You can We've done one in Teams. You can do one inside Slack. You can do it inside your FileMaker application. You don't even have to touch your mm -hmm. workflows to be able to do this. So I'm super excited about it. Um, and I'm also excited to be talking at that conference uh, next week too, just because I'll be, you know, staying at my folks house and yep. um you know being able to speak at a conference at the same time which yep. is just crazy sure. so um just from yeah. a you know a personal worlds collide thing so more lovely. to come on that in the future uh isolutionsai.com forward slash intuition also in the show notes i'm happy to chat with people about it if, if uh they're they're curious but uh, a lot of it on linkedin as well sweet we did, we did it, it. <laughs> So and we'll, we'll be back, um, maybe weeks. not in a couple of weeks, just because the 4th of July, ah. we don't know if people put us in ears, but right after that, um, we'll, we'll be back with another fun episode yep. of Claire's talk and AI information overload. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank we you. We appreciate everybody checking in. Yeah, absolutely, man. I enjoy these and I look forward to talking to you very soon.